है एंड वी आर नाउ लाइव फाइनली ऑन यूट्यूब गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी वेलकम टू कारवान दिटेज एक्सप्लोरेशन इनिशियटिव माई नेम इज ईशान शर्मा एंड वी आर बैक विद अनदर कारवान डिस्टिंग लेक्चर वी स्टार्टेड दिस लेक्चर सीरीज इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वेन वी स्टार्टेड दिस कारवान ऑनलाइन लेक्चर्स एंड सिंस देन वी हैव होस्टेड टेन डिस्टिंग लेक्चर्स एंड वी हैव हैड द ऑनर ऑफ होस्टिंग सम ऑफ द बेस्ट स्कॉलर्स in the world to speak about to interact with the students and and public at large who are interested in academic history this is a domain which is uh, dying in india today seeing the current political and social circumstances but uh, this is an effort karwan the heritage exploration initiative is an effort by us the students who are his history students essentially to save the discipline of ours uh from the clutches of the politicians and from the clutches of the so called uh economist and lawyers trying to be historians and public scholars so to to get to to reclaim the space is what this fight is for and uh, since the last few weeks we have seen on social media how nawab shah jahan begum's image has been uh, misused and abused uh as mumtaz mahal and the person for whom shah jahan the mughal emperor built the taj mahal that's a very popular social media myth that is going around in india today and uh, i think uh, to tackle that to talk about that and much more actually to go into the deep history of the nawab the begum of bhopal and and the great works they did in the making of bhopal that we'll today discuss the title of the talk today is princely independence and the innovation in nawab shah jahan begum's bhopal and the reigning years were 1868 to 2 to 1901 and to do that i think uh, it is our greatest honor to host one of uh, our leading historians of our times we are very fortunate to uh, to to have her here on line professor barbara daily uh, metcalf and i'll just read out a formal introduction which is the norm but she doesn't need an introduction she is somebody who we have read as bachelor student in delhi university and i hope others history students have also read her in different universities in india um Barbara Metcalf born in Philadelphia recounts in the biographical fragment preceding her recent essay collection which came out much early her upbringing in a family whose travel rarely extended beyond the jersey shore by train however her exposure to a culture valuing european languages in high school and swarthmore colleges focus on global social issues during the cold war era expanded her horizons In 1963 she pursued comparative tropical history at the University of Wisconsin under Philip Curtin sparking her interest in Indian uh, studies this fascination led her to complete her doctoral studies at the University of California Berkeley in 1974 focusing on South Asian Muslims and Urdu under the guidance of Ira Lapidus and Hamid Algar shaping her career as a historian with a specialization in the modern history of South Asian ulama Barbara Metcalf served as the president of American History Association in 2010. She is a professor emerita at the University of California Davis, UC Davis, and was Alice Freeman Palmer, uh, professor of history at the University of Michigan from 2003 to 2009. She has authored several notable works including Islamic Revival in British India, Deoband 1860 to 1900 which came out through Princeton University Press in 1982. and Hussain Ahmed Madani the jihad for islam and india's freedom one world uh, in 2009 additionally she has edited islam in south asian practice princeton university press 2009 her scholarly contributions continue with recent publications such as photography and imagination white socks and mughal costumes in 19th century bhopal which came out in objects images stories sigmund digby's historical method edited by francesca orsini away with words nawab siddiq hasan khan 
and the Unexpected Power of Print in the Journal of Royal Asiatic Society. Uh, and on the cusp of the modern colonial modernity, Administration, Women and Islam in Princely Bhopal and Religious Interactions in Modern India, edited by Vasundra Dalmia and Martin Pukes. Barbara Metcalf's outstanding contribution to scholarship have been recognized with numerous awards and fellowships, including the Sir Sayyid, Ahmed, uh, Sir Sayyid International Excellence Award from Aligarh Muslim University in 2022, the Mellon Emeritus Fellowship at the University of Michigan from 2009 to 2012, and a resident fellowship at the Rockefeller Study Center, Bellagio, in 1999. She has also received prestigious fellowships such as the American Institute of Pakistan Studies, Senior Fellowship in Pakistan in 1998, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Grant in Britain and Pakistan in 1991, the Fulbright Islamic Civilization Fellowship in India in 1919, and many more. The list goes on and on and on. But uh, we are truly honored, uh, Professor Metcalf. This is such a great day for us here at Caravan because we were, you know, we are, we are now fanboying today uh, because you have uh, agreed to deliver this Caravan Distinguished Lecture. This is truly uh, a day to to remember for us. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Metcalf, for agreeing to do this. And over to you. Thank you very much, Ishan, for that much too too generous uh, introduction and welcome. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you in return for giving me this honor and this opportunity. What you folks are doing is so deserving of admiration, and you know it goes without saying that I wish you all the best. Um, the takeover of history in our public life or the attempts to do so in both of our countries is a profound danger. And um, efforts to engage the past honestly are enormously important. So more power to you. Um, so I have been th working off and on now for several years on the history of Princely Bhopal. And sort of by, by chance in, in most recently, I have been focused on architecture. And since the word heritage, usually, in, you know, if you say that to people generally, their interest in heritage, it often is the built environment. And since that word is in your initiative, I thought this was a great opportunity for me to talk um, about heritage in relation to Bhopal. And in a sense, with that subject, we circle right back to these comments about history because Bhopal has buildings have very much fallen victim to the Hindu nationalist agenda um, that marginalizes Muslims, turns Muslims into oppressors, so that the buildings of Bhopal are seriously neglected um, and really not a... a, a you know, not part of the civic imagination at this point. So on to the buildings. Um, let me just tell, remind you of, of this amazing story that um, for four generations, these four truly formidable women from the first, you see the date 1819 down to 1926, were in power in Bhopal with a brief interregnum, which I have put in brackets, of one uh, male. All except the first were actually rulers in their own right. They were not regent or serving in some ancillary uh, capacity. And they were the only women uh, in, British, in the British period who had that kind of a role. Um, and, you know, just to repeat, they they are uh, neglected. They don't fit the image of princes, which maybe is <laughs> something like this, the charming Rajput Maharaja. Um, in fact, now that I think about it, in terms of their basic morphology, these two rather look alike. Uh, and so the person who is remembered in Bhopal is of an important historical figure, the 11th century Raja Bhoj. But he's not actually from Bhopal, he's from neighboring Tar. And he is the one who dominates the commemorative landscape of Bhopal. 
this is a rather, I would say, militant looking statue of him on one of Bhopal's beautiful legs, the upper leg. And if you go to Bhopal, it's the Raja Bhoj Airport, University, Road, Bridge, Wetland, renamed lake, and so forth. Um, and as I say, I, you know, I have no, no grievance against Raja Bhoj, a very important historical figure, but so are the Begums. And um, now, did I lose the slides? Do you have the slides on your screen? No, there they no, no. Yeah, there they no, are. They're okay. So I thought you might be interested that, in a sense, a discovery of heritage, a trio of scholars headed by a woman who is a historian of Prince Lee Bhopal has co I read the report they did, which is how I know this, uh, collaborated with a local women's NGO called the Mahashakti Seva Kendra to introduce these women, disadvantaged women, to the Begums. MSK was founded to support women victims of the Bhopal gas tragedy, remember that, in 1984, whose damage is felt to the present. And this is an organization that uses, um, that teaches women practical skills to earn income for their family. And the idea of this group of historians was to introduce the women to the history of the Begums as a, a way to empower them. Um, and um, let's see, what do I have next? Just to remind you of who they are. Um, and they, they anchored their stories in the building. So they took these women around to various buildings that the women probably had seen over and over again, but had no idea that they were associated with the Begums and used that as a springboard to introduce them to history. Um, and I mentioned this use of history, lives as lessons, not to suggest that that should be our goal or our only goal, um, because there really is much more we can learn from the history of Bhopal. And this will be a brief introduction, but I hope it hints at, at some of the bigger issues in the story. Um, quick overview. Um, what became Bhopal, the princely state, was founded by Afghans in the early 18th century, variously beleaguered by Hyderabad and Marathas. Then in 1818, entered into a treaty relation with the East India Company. And basically, as soon as that happened, you move to a whole new level of political development because you're you're secure, right? They're protected. And so the building of Bhopal City begins with Kutsia Begum, who is regent almost as soon as the treaty is signed. And each of these rulers kind of put uh, their mark on a particular section of the city. She developed the old city, widened the streets. This was a walled city, <clears throat> created a plaza, built a Jama mosque which is the sign of an established polity with a Muslim ruler. And interestingly, and sort of equally important, brought in a Scottish engineer to develop a waterworks to supply clean drinking water to the city. And then uh, the, the husband of her daughter was sort of forced into power um, uh, through the pressure of the company up to Lord Bentinck, the governor general, which is kind of interesting because, you know, kind of elementary Indian history, we associate Bentinck with the abolition of sati, women's interests, not so much. He may, he, he is not across the board favorable to women's exercise of their autonomy or power. And so arguably from the treaty, Succession should pass to the lineal descendant, namely Sikandar down here. But they intervened as far as a civil war with Kutsil on one side and the British and Jahangir's people on the other um, to put him into power. And he was worthless. I mean, that's what's so interesting. He totally incompetent, uh, fond of playing soldier. And basically, you can see from the years, he didn't reign very long. He died in his 20s of dissipation. Um, he did make one contribution to the city. The only part of uh, kind of colonial culture he was interested in was the military. 
he himself liked to play soldier, and he laid out a cantonment, a, a Jahangirabad, on the far side of the lake, uh, with streets, aqueduct, palace, and so forth. Uh, and when he died, um, Sikandar Begum did indeed succeed to power, and she was a formidable ruler. You can see a fairly quarter of a century. She was on the right side in the mutiny, which served her extremely well. And she was praised. I mean, this is so interesting. She was always praised as the best prince. And people would use terms like she was the best man of affairs among all the princes. And in a way, it's a, a way to insult, I think, or to diminish other Indian male rulers because it's a woman who is the best. But nonetheless, she was highly regarded, uh, built an elegant palace, um, which formed one side of a new public square outside the old city and made a foundational, let me see what I've got next. Yes, made a, an extraordinarily important architectural innovation <laughs> in building the Moti Masjid. And I, I can just remember how stunned I was. This picture doesn't wholly show it. But when you stand at the base of those stairs, you really feel as if you're in Old Delhi and you're looking at the Jama Masjid. And I think maybe this picture suggests some of that. I think I kind of, I think maybe I've got it spread out a little bit too far. You know, the way you do when you adjust a picture. Um, but it's quite, quite striking and very much built in interaction with mogul, mogul models. Um, so Sikandar is followed by the reign of her daughter and her mark on the city is, so if Kutsia was the old city, uh, Sikandar builds this new section uh, southwest of the old city. Um, Shah Jahan Begum comes in and develops an extraordinary suburb up in the northwest of the city. It's it's hard to tell now because it's all been so built over. But here is an architectural historian, Manu Subti, who calls this the golden period of city building. And here's a quote from his account. A visitor to the city during the time of Shah Jahan would have found the city an incredible and a stunning experience. One would have seen the town nestled among the low range of hills, an irregular mass of large and small buildings rising tier upon tier and interspersed with lush gardens full of big and shady trees. The beautiful skyline of the city was a composition of mass and void. And what's so interesting, or one of the interesting things about the city is, so Bhopal is kind of an amphitheater down to the lake, the extent to which it's built into the land into the landscape. Um, goodness, I keep losing this when I go to change it. Come back, come back. Um, ah, no, I, I don't have anything to show you of the lakes, but uh, what's left from the city are um, the two most important buildings that she put into this new city, each of them built on a lake. In fact, opposite ends so that these two buildings can be viewed, each can be viewed from the other. Um, this one is named the Taj Mahal Palace, interestingly enough. Why am I having so much trouble? getting this in. Sorry. There we go. And the second one, you saw the Taj Mahal. I, let me go back to that if I can. There's the Taj Mahal Palace. It's, um, what is it? Seven stories high and 120 rooms. Gargantuan, monumental. And then her second building that is so famous is the Taj ul Masajid, the crown of the mosques. And I don't know to what extent this picture shows it, but again, at this point, the biggest mosque in India, it can accommodate 175,000 people. It's huge. And 
I mean, going on from these to some other buildings, I have a few kind of questions, points, let's say three, good number, to make about them. And the first one is, why did she build? And why did she build at such a scale? Now, the princely, you know, you all know what the princely states are, 500 odd at the height of the Raj, they're indirect rulers uh, in treaty with the British. Their job is to do not, is to avoid doing things that are outrageous, keep law and order, and be loyal. Right? That's those are the princely states, and they were expected to be patrons. And buildings are one of the things they did. So they had the resources, they built. But at least two angles, I think, nuance this general statement for Shah Jahan. And just in terms of why did she build? She used the buildings, I think, to say loud and clear that she was a sovereign, a ruler in charge. She faced skepticism as a woman ruler. She, of course, faced the routine racial condescension of colonialism. But, you know, another layer of that was the gendered one. Her succession had been delayed for a long, frustrating decade. The 1880s brought a decade of offenses to her dignity, primarily owed to uh, the most powerful colonial official of the day, who sided uh, with familial rivals to her power. Her buildings answered back by their size and the subject I'll move on to, their architectural style. The architectural historian Malia Belly Bose speculates that monumental building offers a resource to women rulers in particular and compares Shah Jahan Begum to two women rulers whose names you may have heard, Ahilya Bai Holkar in the uh, mid 18th century and Begum Samru in the early 19th, also both big builders and Ahilya Bai monumental builder as well. And the second thing about that need to build is that Shah Jahan had a particular problem to solve. Early into her rule, she opted to keep Perda, Perda seclusion. At times, she would appear in public covered from head to toe in the modern style of portable seclusion. You'll see a picture of her later on. Uh, she would meet openly her face uncovered with viceroys in the highest level of society. But the question was, with these limitations, how could her presence be felt generally? And my idea here is that she had two forms of material culture that gave her a public presence. The buildings were one, you know, you knew there was a ruler in town if you had buildings that looked like this. Um, and the other, which is a huge and wonderful subject, totally outside what we can talk about today, is her remarkable stream of Urdu language printed publications. No other woman writing in Urdu, maybe writing in many of the other vernacular languages, approached anything like this record. These publications gave her what I call a sphere of literary sovereignty among an Urdu reading public in Bhopal and beyond. She wrote for an India-wide audience. So invisible though she may have been, she made herself visible through publications and stone alike. And they displayed command of resources, taste, participation in a larger cultural world. And that prompts my second question that I already referred to. Um, what did she hope to convey by architectural style? And the short answer is what she chose was singular and unexpected. Um, and what I'm building up to is a little story about princely resistance. Toward the end of the 19th century, British officials were weighing in on, of all things, the matter of princely architectural style. Why did they care? Official influence on the princes, of course, was expected to be modest, you know, and so when it came to something like architectural style, it's a question of being praised 
or carrot of approval or kind of the stick of disapproval and so forth. And because what they wanted um, was building in the style of the Indo-Saracenic. I don't know if you know that term or not, but this is a style invented by British architects and engineers beginning in the 1870s. It's sort of a Edward Said knowledge and power. You assume that you know India and therefore you can control it. And so you take putative features of Hindu and Muslim building, already a problematic idea, of course, essentialist religious categories of British sociology, throw in a few European touches like Gothic windows or a clock tower. And this creates what's called Indo-Saracenic. And there's a book about this written by none other than my spouse, um, who I, I don't think this is what he talked about, but I know you folks have met him as well in this in this venue. Um, the architectural style, as the historian Thomas Metcalf has shown, was intended to display mastery over India's past and thus affirm British legitimacy as a suitable ruler. Colonial officials used the Indo-Saracenic style widely for public buildings and directly ruled it in British India. So in a sense, what you do is you mask colonial projects in what they take to be traditional garb. So railway stations, courthouses, municipal offices, these are the typical buildings that were put up in Indo-Saracenic. There was a book for this. So what you would do is it was completely timeless and context-free. Um, this Jaipur portfolio, and you have many volumes organized by topics, copings, plinths, capitals, brackets, arches. And it was um, from all over India, no attention to chronology, and you could mix and match. And that produces an Indo-Saracenic building regarded as ideal for princely rulers who are a similar, let's say, artificial embodiment of tradition. And to use it on their part, implied consent to the claim of British legitimacy, an appropriate attitude for what the princes were meant to be, namely key collaborators. Um, let's see if I can get you a picture of that. Okay, here's a nice picture. If you were a prince and you wanted to make your British overlords happy, <laughs> you hired a, a European, usually British architect or engineer to come in and put together Indo-Saracenic buildings, then that would get you a lot of praise. Um, here is Rampur, which like Bhopal is, the, you know, the British categorize the states as Mohammedan, Hindu, or Sikh. So it's another Mohammedan state also of Afghan origin. And it was the site of lavish cultural patronage. That's a fabulous and other subject. You know, we, we associate the uh, musical Gharana. You know, a lot is going on, building a great library. It's very Rampur, fabulous history. Um, and its rulers, especially Nawab Hamid Ali Khan, who was in power from 1880, um, hired an engineer called W.C. Wright, who designed the state buildings and they are immortalized in a photographic album put together for Lord Curzon's visit in 1905. And a lot of that is online. You can see all these Indo-Saracenic buildings. Um, and the idea is that Rampur became a model for this style, the fort, the palaces, the guest house, the library, the railway station, schools, the hospital courts, all exuberantly Indo-Saracenic. And here's a picture of their guest. They had two guest houses, but this was their guest house for Europeans. And um, I know there's a, a kind of pointer that you can use. I don't, maybe I can just, I don't know, does this cursor show? But you can yes, see, yes. okay, you can see their sort of Gothic little steeples on top. Uh, these are meant to be like uh, the little uh, porch, round porches on a mogul building, right? A chutri. Um, 
there the arches I would have said are Moorish because they're alternating color. These would be, I suppose you could say, Mogul influenced. I think this kind of parapet is Palladian. So it's a mixture of multiple styles, overly ornate, you might say, extremely ornate. Um, and, you know, kind of a, a good example of this Indo-Saracenic. So Shah Jahan Begum, like her mother, had zero interest in Indo-Saracenic. And also there was another way many of the princes built, and that was European styles. Some of them had built, you know, I mean, there was a, there was a, a I think it was Kapoortala in Punjab, hired a French architect and tried to recreate Versailles. And so that was another thing, zero interest. And as I say, you know, to completely resist this kind of architecture is a modest, but perhaps satisfying way that a prince might push back against colonial preferences. Um, so the question then becomes, what did she choose instead? And um, the answer is for major buildings, it was mogul models and design features. And this is the entrance to her great mosque, the Taj al -Masajid. I A rather restless statement, which I saw on social media from a visitor to the mosque. I thought somehow I had been transported to Delhi. Once the initial excitement settled, I realized that while the overall design might be inspired by Jama Masjid, it was in a league of its own. So to build in this Mughal style was not a conventional choice at this point, but the model marked Bhopal as more than a regional power. It was a way of claiming the mantle of a great dynasty that polished the image of a state, Bhopal, that had before the British treaty come close to disappearing. Um, but it was not that, just that, it was that for Shah Jahan Begum in particular, it was a dynasty of great cultural achievements. And we have a wonderful text that tells us how she imagined the moguls. She, if you know what the poetic form Musnavi is, long poetic form, um, she published in 1893 a Musnavi, of which a good chunk is called the history of the kings of Hind, of uh, the Sit Old Bayan. And this, I mean, just, I had mentioned her publications in 1893. This was the only public, uh, the, the British, after the mutiny, collected copies of everything printed. This was the only publication they collected from the Northwestern provinces and out, written by a woman in that year. Anyway, that's a detail. But here is what she thought of the moguls. Now, by the late 19th century, there was a growing attitude, which tragically, flourishes today, that the Mughals were foreign invaders who undermined Hindu religion and culture. Full stop. That's the story of the Mughals. Nothing good. But in her talent, they were Muslim, but they were neither foreign nor conquerors, which is pretty interesting. They, as she describes them, starting with Babur, they were just in place. They are rulers who achieve an unprecedented level of peace, justice, happiness, and they build gardens and monuments. How'd she do that? She did it by her own eccentric history. She assigns foreignness and conquest, you won't believe this, to Timur, Tamerlane. And do you remember this in 1397 maybe? He raided into India for two years. That's all he did. He raided, destroyed a few cities and left. Destruction behind. But for her, she turns Timur into a model ruler uh, who sets up a perfect state, leaves a flourishing India, improves India, and then his work done returns, she says, to Iran. Why not? Um, and what that does, it pushes warfare and Muslim conquest into a hoary, 
ill-defined, legendary antiquity. And the great moguls, neither foreign nor militant, you know, she has poetry that describes her reign. You, you hear nothing about conquest. She, she writes only about two of them, Babur and Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan spent a lot of time, I mean, we, we associate him with great archi architecture, but he spent a lot of time on the battlefield. And Babur, you know, he's the con nothing, nothing about them. These are people who devote themselves to cultural patronage, participate in the shared epics and customary celebrations like Dussehra, Diwali, and Holi, and turn out to be, in my reading, perfect models for a princely ruler in late colonial British India, who never go to war, who are fully at home in Hindustan, who are embedded in the Indian cultural landscape. So that is the Mughals. And there's something more to that. Not only are, is the pull of Mughals, I think it was a matter of good taste. Indo-Saracenic, when you had the symmetric, elegant mogul structures of unparalleled workmanship as inspiration. And um, Shah Jahan Begum and her mother, in the years after the mutiny, went to a number of Durbars and they toured on the way back. And it's so interesting. So this is well before these the buildings like this were done. But they would go to a city like Jaunpur. Now, when you go to Jaunpur, what you go to see are the Sharki buildings from the 15th century. We are extraordinary. No, the only thing in their notes that they describe is they find the Mughal Bridge. So they're looking for Mughal architecture. They're interested in it, both of them, from the very beginning. So I think that's all very interesting. Um, and using this... And another clue about the Indo-Saracenic, maybe I'm reading too much into this. On the tour, they go to see the Martiniere. Does that mean anything to any of you? It's It was built by a Frenchman in Lucknow and it became as his house. Then it became a school. And in one of the movies, I think Shakespeare Walla opens with panning over this very elaborate building. And they are very disapproving because it is, again, this mixture of multiple styles, very over elaborate. And in the notes, it basically says, we, you know, we, we just couldn't figure out why people are so enthusiastic about this building. So I think it's a matter of, for them, the t good taste goes in this direction, not toward these, these other buildings. And I do think it's a modest way of pushing back against official power. As people have been interested in the princes, they've looked for that. Typically, very modest ways you subvert ceremony protocol. You, you contest a border delineation. You go to Britain, as Sultan Jahan, the fourth of the women, does, to challenge the succession that the British want. To build independently, to have no resident British engineer or architect calling the shots. I think this is a modest form of pushback too. So finally, um, my third point um, about these buildings is that they are an occasion for creativity and originality. And just by looking at some of the buildings, I hope I can make that point. So Shah Jahanabad is, is where we really start. How am I doing in terms of time, Ishan? We have about 20 minutes uh, for the lecture. I'm okay. I'm yeah. okay? Okay. Yes, you are. <laughs> so, once in power, she had moved quickly to build a dam in the northwest of the city to improve the city water and also for water features. And using this undulating landscape with that water, she built gardens and three artificial lakes as the core of Shah Jahanabad. Vaulted drains brought water to the lakes, and as the drains passed through important buildings, they brought the natural feature of water into the interior. This is a use familiar from Mughal president, widespread. So the water is use, useful to have, but it also is transformed into fountains, cascades, streams, pools, designed to be a sensory delight of cooling, sight, sound, 
and fragrance as rose or other um, uh, additives are put in. The buildings and large water bodies were connected by plinths and platforms, dams and embankments to the various buildings. So this is a very interesting use of the landscape, the topography, and this architectural historian Manu Sapti, who has written a survey as his master's thesis, actually, of years ago, decades ago, um, made a very interesting point that the layout of Shah Jahanabad was a dramatic contrast to the densely built up character of Bhopal's walled city or even Delhi's Shah Jahanabad. Um, it, this openness, he suggests, was a reflection of much of the urban planning of the late 19th century, where you have parks, gardens, open spaces, as well as all of the, you know, markets, housing, uh, governing buildings, whatever you have in a city. Um, Subti in this is always struggling to make Bhopal into an Islamic city. And he's a good enough He's good enough at describing it that he says it's an Islamic city and then immediately undermines that by showing, for example, for the walled city, that this pre-existing city also had a religious building at its center and that the neighborhoods were organized by craft, whatever. This might have been true of Muslim cities, but it's true of a lot of other cities as well. And finally, he gives up on Shah Jahanabad. He asks, is it an Islamic city, but ultimately concludes that it represented an absolutely new schema with a use of landscape in particular that had a few precedents in the Islamic world. We have no evidence that that was what Shah Jahan Begum was thinking about, but clearly Manu is. Um, and the first project, which you've already seen a picture, was the humongous palace. Oh, dear. Yes, this is it. You saw the picture of the the huge towering palace, which sadly is very much um, in decay today. Uh, Taj Mahal, not because it was modeled in the Taj Mahal, though it has many, much of a mogul visual vocabulary. Arches, you can see cusped entries, balustrades, domed chutries, elegant courtyards, water features. It has a Sawan Badon Pavilion, which is a feature of Mo a number of Mughal gardens in Delhi's Red Fort, which are these pavilions that are meant for um, uh, cooling, for, for enjoying the freshness of water, even the sound of rain. Um, even, and in this case, the, I don't have a picture of this, blue tiles imported from Persian to give the impression of water. Uh, it, so it was neglected. It was used uh, to house refugees after 1947. Um, and you can see, I showed you those pictures of the decay, but this gives you an idea, both of the how large one of the courtyards is and how beautiful it is. And uh, if you go online for any of these old palaces, there's always somebody planning to turn one into a hotel. And again, that's discussed here. It would save the building, but of course then it, it transforms it. You turn it into, you know, lobbies and hotel rooms, uh, but it also makes it impossible for people like those women who are touring around that we talked about at the beginning. Um, let me move on to the mosque, the, the great Taj al-Masajid, her most celebrated monument, and in fact, very, very well taken care of. Um, for half a century, it was used for the annual meetings of Tbiliki Jamaat, uh, this huge Islamic proselytizing movement because it was so big. Um, as I say, the biggest mosque in India at the time, uh, when it was built, they talked about, there was a fatwa, actually issued asking if it was legitimate to build on a particular, for various reasons, but talking about the model at um, Burhanpur. But in any case, whether it's Burhanpur, Badshahi, Jama, whatever, these mosques all share a number of the same features 
and the Taj al Masajid has them as well. Um, it was used in a survey done by the Architectural Survey of India in the about in, in the early 20th century, and it was used as an example of the very high quality of India's living uh, uh, architectural tradition. That the mysteries who came in were transforming the building from its original plan as they built, and they were uh, building to an extremely high level of competence. Um, the author of the survey, and this is very important, this is not mimicry. This is not just reproducing a building. And he was very uh, interested in what he called the boldness of the Chhatri pavilions and the most interesting design feature, which you don't see in this picture, which are there are what he calls commodious chapels and galleries for women. Very unusual in an Indian mosque and very much a reflection of Shah Jahan's commitment to a kind of reformist Islamic tradition that opens the mosque to, wis uh, to women. There were other distinctive uh, features. El and you can, if you look online at the many pictures of the mosque, you'll see this. There were jolly screens of formal design that are not carved out of stone, but forged in metal. Um, they used reinforced concrete for these minars that are so tall. And I think it's important because I have a kind of, there's a British architectural historian who who is kind of the person I argue against in all of this, who sees these, all of the buildings of the Begums as mimicry and sterile and failed Islamic architecture, which is a terrible category. But there was a lot of innovation and a lot of quality building. Let me briefly mention two other buildings. This, this was, when I've been to Bhopal, this was locked. But now you can see videos online of the interior. This is the unparalleled mosque, the Bey Nazir. And as you can see, it was a summer palace. It had steps down to the water, many water features. Uh, it used techniques that the Bhopal buildings really from the beginning specialized in to facilitate wind ventilation. So it's built on the lake. The area behind is kept open to get a breeze. And it's built in the shape of the English letter H. So hardly a mogul example in that um, to facilitate cross ventilation. Uh, I think that's what's interesting that these there's no rigidity here. Here are some, this is the from the interior of the palace, sorry. Let me see if I can go back. Um, you can see how um, metal, where you might have expected wood, is used here to create these very delicate arches and brackets. This is imported blue and green glass, which is quite, quite beautiful. Oh, I saw this thing, you know, somebody on Instagram or somewhere is publishing a picture and it says, and if you want a souvenir, you can just pick out a piece of glass and take it with you. So um, that these buildings need protection and um, more care, I think, is, is pretty clear. I don't have pictures of the gardens, but there were multiple gardens with mogul names. Hayat Afsa, Nur Afsa, Farhat Afsa, Dilkusha, Eshbag, located throughout the city. Um, some of often the charbog style of the moguls there were built there were gardens built specifically for the rainy season to particularly flower then and a final mogul inspiration the tomb of nawab sadiq hasan Han, her very shah Jahan, very beloved and very controversial second husband a lot of opposition as a widow she remarried a man of her own choice can you imagine um, and he is laid to rest. She defied everyone. She buried him not only with a mosque that is, if you look at that and you look at the tomb for Aurangzeb, you see how close in, in style they are. And she married him in Barabagh which is a very famous garden in Bhopal, which has, among other things, the tombs of the dynasty's progenitors. Um, let me move on quickly then just to 
tell you, show you a few more pictures because she not only built in a mogul style, remember back to the Rampur house, instead of Indo-Saracenic for her kind of civic buildings, look what she did. Here was her guest house. She used a bungalow style. This was the Lal Koti, which today is, there's not, oh, I promised you a picture of her. Here she is. Um, this is the Lal Koti and you can see it's built like a bungalow sloping roof, veranda, thick walls. Um, here is the railroad station, which in these years was often very ornate, not at all. Again, this very clean bungalow style. This is, and here she is again, dressed up to go out um, with the ladies. This is the Lady Lansdowne Hospital for Women that she built. And you can see all built of the rough stone, the sloping tiled roof, the veranda. Um, if the palaces and mosques within their mogul design features place Bhopal within a remembered India of a glorious Muslim pre-colonial past, I think the public buildings again, make a very clean architectural statement, very utilitarian, very attractive. Um, and they place Bhopal in the India of the present. This is a contemporary design. So, yeah, I put these two together just as a reminder of the difference of what Bhopal is doing um, at this level. The safest path by the late decades of the century was to opt for the Indo-Saracenic and hire an English engineer, a reassuring choice for the colonial rulers who saw even architecture as a strategy for managing consent. Shah Jahan Begum did not comply. A through line of her life, which I've argued in other, you know, for her life as a whole, including this unconventional marriage, was her claim on her own personal autonomy. She didn't want Europeans at her court and she didn't have them. More than mere resistance was at stake. The buildings were an opportunity to showcase her creativity, her patronage of the Garden City in the Northwest that we've described, um, her mosques, with their uh, unprecedented design for women and her Eidga, unprecedented women's participation. All of this identified her as an energetic Muslim committed to contemporary reform. The neo-Mogul style aligned her with a heritage of Mogul taste, grandeur, and pleasure. And her buildings bespoke sovereignty. Um, uh, and it is. it occurred to me recently, there, how's that for a surprising final slide? Um, this is kind of my coda. That maybe she built not only to assert herself in the present, but to be remembered long after. Remember, we began by marveling at the unbelievable monumentality of the palace and the mosque. They are so huge. And maybe this is what gave her the idea of hugeness. Both she and her mother, and in due course, all the Begums, in extraordinary ways, would facilitate the preservation of Sanchi, which is in their territory. Um, the extraordinary uh, architectural historian, whose work some of you may know, Nayan Jot Lahiri, is that name reading a bell? fabulous work, has a great article on Bhopal. And she basically holds Sanchi up as a kind of ironic story. Who despoils Sanchi? The Brits, who go in there, dig carelessly through the mid-19th century to extract whatever is inside it. Who preserves this? And again, from Nyanjo's point of view, it's not, most of the credit is always given to British, to the architectural survey, in fact, it is the Bhopal Nawabs, the women, who work to preserve this. In the 20th century, Sultan Jahan will try to reassemble the looted objects from there. Um, uh, Shah Jahan and Sikandar participated in creating casts of this that were taken to Britain. And maybe this, that very interesting story apart, 
Um, maybe she looked at this and thought her vast structures would preserve her memory, just as this one did uh, so many centuries later. Um, recent surveys of architectural projects of the princes never include the Begums. It's interesting. And of course, they are largely derelict, except for the mosques. They deserve recognition for what they did and what they avoided. For Shah Jahan Begum, they point to a woman whose life threaded the ambiguous British needle of princely status with self-confidence and creativity, who chart, charted many ways, uh, who, who chose to chart her own distinctive course in many ways, including a build, building program like no one else's. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Metka, for that uh, brilliantly uh, presented and uh, and you know brilliantly uh, presented lecture today, because uh, this is something that uh, we usually don't talk about. You know, women have been in our history, historical narrative, traditionally in pushed to the margins, and now it is. It is. Uh, we are fortunate that we could uh, host this lecture and get to know about a, a ruler who stood her own uh, grounds against the imperial authorities in a time when other popular regimes like the Sindhyas were trying to befriend the British. And they were trying to get in the good books of mm. the of the British. So uh, I'll just stop the sh uh, screen share. Uh, I'll just stop the. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, remove the PowerPoint from here so that people can see oh. both of us on the. Thank you. Uh, on the screen. Thank you so much for that lecture. Uh, I would like to know. Uh, I was just reading. I'm just trying to complete Ruby Lal's new book on Gulbadan uh, Banu Begum, and. Uh, uh, she has mentioned how we have to look to at places where people traditionally don't look in the archives uh, because they don't women don't feature in the forefront of mainstream court histories and 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 traditional accounts so when you were researching in the 70s or the 80s how was the archives then and how difficult was it to look for accounts on uh, shah jahan begum well, I didn't really start um, working on uh, on Bhopal until much later. I mean, it's really just been the last 10 years or so. Um, in the 70s and 80s, I, of course, worked on Dayabund. And the Dayabund records were very well kept. And so because I was working on a particular uh, school, I had access to, you know, whatever. And they also printed an annual report that would include things like um, their donations, who were their supporters, and I could work from them. I've always worked a lot from printed materials. It's true. Um, because of the um, idiosyncrasy of the kind of topics I've, I've worked on. Um, but I've certainly, you know, always tried to find whatever I could in the National Archives of British Library. Uh, the Delhi, when I worked on um, Hakim Ajmal Khan and medicine, the Delhi Municipal Archives, which used to be above the bus uh, bus stop, bus station in Old Delhi, you know, places like that. Um, for, the Beck, for the Bhopal project, uh, there are, I, I certainly spent a lot of time going through the British records because they do document um, very much, you know, every exchange. And in the Delhi archives, you've got both Urdu materials and English language materials available. That is a very, very well documented. I had no luck whatsoever in Bhopal because at the time I only went once and at that point, they were not making uh, their records available because they had no one on staff who could read or do. Um, so I was kind of thwarted. 
But for me, the publications of the fact that Shah Jahan Begum wrote so much means that I have fabulous material to work on for her. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it, it definitely did answer. And because you also mentioned the inspiration she took from the Mughals uh, in her works and in her uh, initiatives. I also want, I was thinking when you were speaking about her as, as a as a female ruler in, in those times, what was the haram situation like in her domestic uh, area? Was there a haram in the Bhopal royal uh, household as well? Oh, uh, you know, I think the whole issue of women's sociality in this kind of elite setting is extremely interesting. And in fact, when I put together the slides, I can't, I probably can't find them now. The, um, the Musnavi comes with images, uh, with drawings. And many of the drawings, although nothing is explicitly said about it, are all of women having fun. I almost feel as if I should dig these out if I, I probably can't find them quickly enough. But when you come to Emperor Babur, the only picture, the drawing to illustrate him, what would you expect? I mean, I'm not sure what you would expect, but you know, he was a brilliant military tactician as he figured out the initial conquest. You know, there are all kinds of things about his reign. No, the, old, the poem describes him at the end of his day, meeting out justice in the Diwane Am, you know, being uh, the great benign king, he would ride out to see his kingdom and come to the edge of the water. And so what we have is a picture of the Jumna, Yamuna, presumably, of women in the river, cavorting, playing, splashing each other, having fun. And similar, there are pictures of gardens with women just kind of hanging out together. In the, in the palace itself, in Shah Jahan's time, there absolutely was a notion of a distinctive Zenana culture. She was a poet. She published not only the Musnavi, but two diwans of poetry. The first one, this is a nice little story, with <clears throat> the Takulus Shirin, you know, sweet. By the time she published her second, her, her pen name was Tajwar, the crown bearer, this claim on sovereignty. Uh, but she also assembled around her women poets who are described at length, some of whose pub poetry is also published. So there is a sense of women's shared intellectual, cultural life, women's shared amusements, like that. Uh, these are all, these women are women who are either wives, daughters, or somehow involved with men in the, in the court. And that, that is what populates the women's section. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Isha? Yeah, it does. Yes. And uh, because you just mentioned about the men in the court, I wanted to know who are the advisors to Shah Jahan Begum? Were there women in the cabinet and the advisory who were helping Shah Jahan out or was there only men available in the court? That is a great question. Um, and I'd have to go back and check this, but do you know the convention that when you finish a major publication, at the end of it, there are many, many people come in to make a poetic couplet that gives the date of completion. By count, each Arabic letter has a numerical value and they will add up to, you know, 1327 or whatever date, Hijri date it was, or sometimes they'll do it in the Gregorian date. My sense is that all of those are men from the court. Is that possible? 
You've really asked me an interesting question. That's just an impression. And now I will have to check. But I think that is the case. I'm looking around. I, I, yeah, I obviously can't stop and count right now, but I think that's it. Which suggests that they are the people who matter more to her. At least because, for in public. Yeah, because she's also taking inspiration from the Mughal emperors. And not from, say, Holkar, Ahilya Bai, or uh, uh, Lakshmi Bai, who were contemporaries, almost contemporaries, or just before her reign. And she's taking those men as examples to lead her way. And then also the second part of this is how she's remembered. Is she remembered as manly or or as a feminine ruler? Because... When we read the Hindi poetry on Lakshmi Bai uh, in our textbooks, it says "Khub ladi mardani wo to wali," and she fought like a man. So, how how she's remembered in the popular? I think that's very interesting. Um, in a sense, it was it was much more true for Sikandar, who came to power in eighteen forty 1840, from eighteen forty four to sixty eight. And she actually was a horsewoman. She could ride 25 miles a day around her kingdom. And she marshaled troops during the mutiny. And she was her own commander in chief. I can remember somebody writing. And she is regarded almost as a unisex figure. Um, there are people who uh, one I could one of the accounts uh, by a Frenchman says as she approached I thought it was a man uh, because the the clothing was identical the court clothing was identical. Uh, interest for Shah Jahan Begum at the end of the nineteenth century as the kind of cult of domesticity spread for respectable for the respectable class right. Women are supposed to be the guardians of the inner world. They're supposed to be the domestic goddess at some level, right? She, How does she solve that problem? Because she's a ruler doing a man's job in the man's world. She solves it by, I think, in part by getting married. She, Her mother, both her grandmother and mother ruled as widows the entire time, which simplified their self-presentation. She presented herself very much in a feminine mode. Um, so I think that's an important difference. I think time matters here. Yeah. And uh, what about the ulemas in during her time? How did they react to this? There is an association with the Tablighi Jamaat also, as you mentioned, this was the, the mosque was the place where they used to gather for their annual uh, event. How did they react to a woman uh, leading them? Well, uh, Tablighi Jamaat, of course, doesn't take off until the 1920s. So it's after her time. And uh, I think the, I th I'm pretty sure that the Tablighis don't start using the mosque until the 40s. It may be that it's only then that they become so big now that I think about it. Um, so it's in that period after after the princely era. As far as the ulama are concerned, um, the, uh, I can hear an alarm going off in the house. Will you excuse me just a second? I'm gonna go turn an alarm, I'll be right back. Oh, sure. Oh, it's all good. Sorry. Um, her second husband was a major figure of, in the in a, one particular sectarian movement, Sadiq Hassan Han, very important intellectual, and he assembled a large scholarly group as a patron around him, and so Bhopal became a center of. Uh, Islamic publication, to which Shah Jahan Begum herself contributed. She wrote a major book uh, on moral guidance, behavior, moral and practical guidance behavior for, for family life. And although it's called 
the book is called Tezib or Niswa or Turbeyat al Insan. And but it is not just for Niswa, not just for women. It often addresses parents, both husband and wife, uh, in how they should live, how they should raise their children, how should they should live within their house. So the fact that her husband is this big religious intellectual figure, the fact that she also identifies herself with this kind of moral behavior, I think goes a long way to keeping uh, her reputation intact. But now, now that is in uh, challenged by the uh, the current regime that they are trying to superimpose, uh, say, Raja Bhoj over uh, over yep. the the creator of yep. modern Bhopal in many yes. senses. Yes, so how I do think you that's see right. that as a problem for as a historian. How do you see that as a problem? Uh, as a threat to the identity of a city. Well, you know, when history is used in public life, it tells a lot about the present, right? And how how you challenge that is hard to say. Now, I suppose you could argue that the more uh, these have buildings are, say, turned into heritage hotels, from that point of view, the better, right? At least that way, they would still, they would be visible and there would be some sense of what their origin was. I don't know. I don't know what the answer there is. But Raja Bhoj is a very big presence in Bhopal, in the city. Yeah. Have you been to Bhopal recently? I haven't been there now. It's <laughs> been a while. And so I don't know. Maybe things have changed. Maybe somebody who's here will send me an email and say, you've got to come back and look at how things have changed. So you, you, I think you should come back to Bhopal for sure. But thank you so much, Professor Metka, for taking our time this morning for you uh, to deliver this lecture. And we were honored to host both you and Tom for the lecture. And you know, this oh, is such a great, great I know it's for us. <laughs> One of us after the other. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very thank you much. So much. And thank you so much, like everybody, for joining in. Uh, we will be publishing the transcript of the Distinguished Lecture Series soon. So uh, you can read the, the speech or the lecture on the website, carvanheritage.in, for free. And keep sharing because we are trying to create a free archive for all of you to access anytime because we need to make um information available uh, in different languages in different formats and now we are also trying to translate some of these lectures into different indian languages so that they can be printed and circulated and and maybe read in public uh, in different cities that's what how that's how we can uh, create a revolution to uh, promote and to protect academic history and uh, thank you so much, Professor Metka, for joining this movement uh, to save public history and academic history in India. It was good. An honor. Real, real pleasure to be be here and wishing you all the best. Bye bye. Thank you so much, ma'am. Bye, everybody. Thank you. And keep reading, keep thinking, keep questioning. That's how you'll keep yourself sane in these insane times. Take care.